Coming of age in the 1980s was vastly different compared to what today's teenagers go through. Luckily for Gen X, they had the films of John Hughes to guide them through those tricky years. John Hughes connected with teens in a way that no other director, producer, or screenwriter has ever done. This was a time when going to the theater or renting movies from your local blockbuster was a ritual every weekend. So when movies like Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club, and St. Elmo's Fire came along, it resonated. It also made movie stars of its young actors, and Hughes would reuse them in multiple films, making them the new IT actors in Hollywood. This got the group branded the Brat Pack in an attempt to marginalize their work. Nonetheless, members of the Brat Pack always held Hughes in high regards, praising him as a director and crediting him for their successful careers. But it wasn't until recently that his most beloved and central figure to the Brat Pack turned her back on John Hughes following his death, suggesting the man who created these coming-of-age films did so with a chauvinistic, homophobic, and racial slant that made Molly Ringwald no longer see John Hughes in the same genius light. Those movies, the movies that, you know, are, I'm so well known for, they were very much of a time, you know? And, and if you were to remake that now, I think it would have to be much more diverse and it would have to be, um, you know, it, you couldn't make a movie that white <laughs> now. No, those movies are really, really very white. <laughs> and, and they don't really represent, um, you know, what it is to be a teenager in a school in America today, I don't think. John Hughes' films have remained popular for decades due in part to their authentic dialogue that truly connected with American youth from that time. He consistently centered his films with a teenage protagonist, always giving them the respect they often lacked from adults. Regardless of the perceived seriousness of their issues, Hughes treated the characters, along with his young actors, as being significant in his eyes. Hughes directed many movies, but his most impactful were Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Pretty in Pink. These films showcased a talented ensemble cast and introduced the concept of optimism and good energy triumphing over negativity, especially in the chaotic world of high school. And central to all three of these movies was his star, Molly Ringwald. Molly admitted that she never had to audition for Hughes because their first film together, Sixteen Candles, was written especially for her. She said, He had gotten my picture from a stack of headshots, and he just had it up on his wall. And over a weekend, he wrote Sixteen Candles while looking at my picture. The Brat Pack was more than just one person, though, and the exact number of members is sometimes debated. But the core group included eight actors, Molly Ringwald, Judd Nelson, Anthony Michael Hall, Ali Sheedy, Demi Moore, Rob Lowe, Andrew McCarthy, and Emilio Estevez. These actors would start together in numerous films from the mid to late 1980s, and not all of them were directed by John Hughes, but collectively their film work revolved around youthful energy, a bit of recklessness, and most importantly, seizing the moment. This teen overlap from movie to movie is really why the phrase the Brat Pack was coined. In an article written by David Bloom for New York Magazine in 1985, he came up with the catchy name for the group, which was a play on the name Rat Pack from the 1960s. He saw them as a group of young and arrogant actors who didn't seem to take the acting profession seriously. The impact of the magazine article was significant and the moniker stuck. The actors felt betrayed. They instantly went from young and talented to unprofessional and privileged. This fractured the group and by the end of the decade, they were all going their own separate ways. Let me ask you, there's a big article in New York Magazine yes. about yeah. something called the Brat Pack. Right. Right, and I heard that you wanted to join. I'd like to be in yeah, this group. Right. From Just from what I read, I want to be in there. Following the release of Sixteen Candles, Molly Ringwald became Hughes' muse. In the book, You Couldn't Ignore Me If You Tried, written by Susanna Gora, she claims that the young actor held a lot of power over the famous director. She also said they had a special connection and were so close that they would often finish each other's sentences. However, after finishing the 1986 film Pretty in Pink, Molly Ringwald never worked with John Hughes again. She believed her growth as an actor would be hurt if she continued working with him. 
and she recognized that it was a time to move on to other roles. The only problem was she wasn't getting the ones she wanted. She was turned down for the roles in Working Girl and The Silence of the Lambs, and she passed on other opportunities that were offered to her, like Pretty Woman and Ghost. So she left Hollywood and moved to Paris to get away from it all. John Hughes died from a heart attack in 2009, and he was, and still is, celebrated as a visionary and trailblazer for his contribution to the teen genre. His young characters, who were often women, were given more depth and significance than ever seen before on film. Ringwald benefited from this, and the roles were crucial in establishing her legacy as an actor. Even she admits that at least two of Hughes' movies, Pretty in Pink and Sixteen Candles, dove into the emotions and experiences of young women that others could easily relate to. This is why they were commercially successful, and these films in particular would become inspiration for future teen movies like American Pie, Mean Girls, and Superbad. After revisiting her iconic roles in John Hughes' movies, the same ones that propelled her to fame, Molly Ringwald came to an uncomfortable realization about Hughes. She even laid it out in an article for The New Yorker, where she reflects on the issues of male chauvinism, homophobia, and racial inequities portrayed in his movies. She talks about watching The Breakfast Club with her 10-year-old daughter, and while watching it, she noticed underlying problems permeated throughout. According to her, instances of demeaning and disrespectful treatment was a theme of his movies. This awakening led her to investigate more of John Hughes's earlier work as a writer for National Lampoon magazine in the 1970s. She found exactly what she was looking for, articles that contained distasteful themes with no humanity. She acknowledges, yes, it was a different time as people say, still I was taken aback by the scope of the ugliness. This ugliness, she describes, was based on articles written for a magazine that dealt strictly in over-the-top parody and humor that was outrageous from beginning to end and was perfectly appropriate for the 1970s. She maintains that she still takes pride in the films she was in, especially in her contribution, but she still views them as racist and misogynistic, and points to how Hughes wrote his scripts with careless homophobic slurs and exaggerated racial stereotypes as side stories. Think Long Duck Dong and Sixteen Candles. In The Breakfast Club, she now considers the way her character was treated throughout the film as sexual harassment, and even assault. Judd Nelson's character calls her names, and even sneaks a peek up her skirt at one point. And despite all of this, he succeeds in winning her affection by the end of the movie. In addition, Molly Ringwald feels really uneasy about a scene in the movie Sixteen Candles. She said it took her some time to fully grasp the significance of the ending, where the charming Jake exchanges his drunk girlfriend Caroline for a pair of underwear belonging to Ringwald's character. It's then implied that Ted, who's the geek in the movie, loses his virginity to a drunken Caroline, essentially taking advantage of her while she's passed out. But after they wake up, Ted is the one who had to ask her if they had sex, which proves that Ted is not the bad guy she makes him out to be. All of these new revelations by Ringwald come after reflecting on her own encounters in Hollywood. She shared her own experience of sitting on the edge of a bed with an unknown producer, feeling lightheaded and woozy from drinking too much, and then a friend walking into the room, saving her from the situation. She noted that her situation was not nearly as traumatic as others left in the wake of Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement. But she does think that the movies made by John Hughes perpetuate systematic attitudes towards that kind of female subjugation. Despite now not being a fan of Hughes's approach with his most popular films, she still believes he authentically captured the experiences of teenagers, including anger and the fear of loneliness. The movies provided solace by showing that others have similar feelings. It is difficult to determine if these redeeming factors outweigh the questionable content for Ringwald, but her unappreciative critique of John Hughes is pretty clear. Despite the fact that he made her exactly what she wanted to be, a famous actress, but he really gave her more than that, because Molly Ringwald is not just an actress, she is a cultural icon now. John Hughes, Molly Ringwald, and the backdrop of the suburban 1980s will forever be linked. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything, and please consider subscribing and sharing Recollection Road Entertainment with someone you know. If you enjoyed this video, consider watching this playlist. As always, thank you so much for watching.